let's take a look before we move on to style at the Brady and the Heston texts on gun control. There was an assassination attempt on uh, President Reagan during his uh, administration. He was outside a venue and a man named John Hinckley came up and fired shots and one hit Reagan. And another uh, seriously injured man named Jim Brady who worked in the White House. And later Sarah uh, Brady and Jim Brady promoted uh, changes in uh, federal gun laws. So that's in part the context about this. That was a very serious incident. Reagan lost half of his blood. He could have bled to death if they hadn't gotten to a hospital really quickly. Uh, it's true that when he was about to be operated on, he turned to the surgeon and said, I hope you're a Republican. <laughs> Quick thinking. <laughs> I'm sure whether the, whatever political party the surgeon was, the surgeon did the best job possible. Reagan lived, he recovered. Uh, Brady suffered some permanent damage, suffered some permanent brain damage. So you see that the narratio here is quite long because it's a kind of history of not only the Bradys personally, which is important for this presentation because this is an appeal based on a personal injury, among other things. It's, it's called the Brady Bill. This happens in our society. In other words, there becomes, and I don't use this in a negative sense, but there becomes a kind of poster person for a particular cause. The Brady Bill was connected with their family history, so she goes into that. And then she says, Jim and I decided we should do something about it. But the gun lobby defeated the Brady Bill. Now eventually the Brady Bill was passed, and it was passed uh, when President Clinton was in office. And there has to be a waiting period when you buy a gun. Though it's a complicated situation because under what circumstance does there not need to be a waiting period when you buy a gun? When you buy it legally. What, under what circumstance do you not have a waiting period? Yes, gun shows. Yeah. Gun, well, describe a gun show. I've never been to one, but... I haven't either, but um, I think it's like a convention hall or a sports arena or something, and they're just like, you know, tables with guns yes. and sellers. Yes, and, and very, very often they're used firearms, and sometimes they're antique firearms, and collectors go there, other people go there. But you can go there, and the person selling the firearm is supposed to ask you whether you have any legal impediment to buying it. There are certain questions, that, and you generally will answer no, and then you can buy the gun. There's no waiting period. Now, having said that, I cannot say that guns purchased at gun shows have been shown to have been firearms that have been involved in more crimes than the average number of guns. I can't say that. I don't know that there's any data on that. It would be interesting to see it, but no one has ever claimed that. Yet the fact is you don't have to wait. So there's been a continual argument about what some people call the gun show loophole. And some people want to close it and other people don't want to close it. So the, the, the whole gun control situation is extremely complex. And we tend as a nation to say this and that, just as we do on so many issues. The abortion issue is, is complex, this and that. But different states have different laws governing age, term of abortion, various things. It's a, it's a complicated situation. So, Sarah Brady says, well, that was wonderful, but we need to do more. You want to change the law so that you essentially um, perhaps cannot buy a semi-automatic weapon. Semi-automatic weapons are weapons in which you, every time you pull the trigger, a shot is fired. An automatic weapon means you simply hold the trigger down and a number of shots are automatically fired. The National Rifle Association once had the position that every citizen in the United States should be able to own 
a firearm equal to any weaponry owned by the government. They aban well, I know, <laughs> they abandoned that position quite a long time ago. Um, one can hardly imagine the private ownership of thermonuclear weapons, for example. But this became a big issue in the 1930s when gangsters used what kind of weapons? Yeah, Tommy guns. They used um, basically automatic submachine guns, handheld automatic submachine guns. You know, I'm, you may feel all this detail is completely extraneous to, to the study of rhetoric, but it's not. Because every rhetorical approach to every question has to understand that question as fully as possible. There are nuances. Near the end of the excerpt that we have, she has a refutation. And this is uh, about three paragraphs from the end. The gun lobby likes to say that Jim and I are trying to take guns away from hunters and sportsmen. The gun lobby is wrong. To the hunters and sportsmen of America, we say, keep your guns. Just give us the laws that we agree to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and out of the hands of our children. 